Professor Erika Kermans, uh, who works in a Technion uh, in Israel. Uh, so, uh, Professor Kermans got his uh, PhD in France under the supervision of uh, Roger Ménard, which many of you must not know. It's, it's a kind of a generation, but he was very important for the community, uh, uh, for his community. So uh, then he did a postdoc with uh, Philippe Nozier before getting a permanent uh, CNRS uh, position in France. And uh, four years later, in uh, 91, he moved to uh, Technion uh, in Israel uh, to work with uh, mesoscopic physics uh, of photons, uh, statistical uh, mechanics, and uh, in general quantum effects in, uh, in these uh, mesoscopic systems. Uh, so we will have a series of lectures uh, by him. So thank you very much uh, for coming. And uh, just one thing, I mean, if you need to go out of the room during uh, the lectures, please use the back door. Uh, and uh, for questions, uh, if you have questions, please ask me the microphone uh, so that it goes on a record. Okay, thank you. Please. Thank you, uh, Romain. <coughs> uh, good afternoon. I must tell you, uh, from the very beginning, I'm just exhausted. I'm coming from, I even don't know what is the, the, the time and this. I'm coming from, uh, where from? Ah, I was in the March meeting now in Las Vegas. It was great. <laughs> uh, and on, uh, on, I am on my way to, to, to the UK, to another conference, to, so, but, this is my second visit here. I was here a few years ago with the same kind of uh, nice students. I enjoyed it very much. And this is why uh, uh, when the organizers proposed to me to come again, I did not. Uh, so in fact, I could not because of the COVID. But I'm really very happy to, to be here uh, again while being exhausted. So I guess you are also exhausted. Uh, so I will uh, mostly show you uh, pictures without too many uh, equations, although I'm a theoretician. And I hope you will uh, enjoy the show. Uh, so let's start. So uh, the title of the, 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 this series of three lectures, mesoscopic uh, photons. But in order to understand mesoscopic physics of photons, you have to understand what is mesoscopic physics. Photons never heard about what is mesoscopic physics. Okay. It's not such a bad choice to uh, make what is the, the meaning of mesoscopic Physics. So, just in a one, the, idea, the microscopic microscopic systems, electric system conductors, or uh, electromagnetic systems are classical. There is no quantum effects, right? I mean, even for me, if uh, if I describe a, a quantum a transport properties of a conductor of a wire of copper, it is Classical, purely classical, okay? So you can tell me, oh, but the Fermi energy, it's quantum. Uh, for me, it is not. But uh, perhaps we can adjust our opinions after the, the, those three lectures. But uh, when now you need to be microscopic, there are many quantum effects you just heard, okay? Either for atoms or for the electrons in uh, conductors. And mesoscopic physics is just at the borderline between the two. How uh, uh, coherent effects, quantum coherent effects, are going to disappear? And what, what do we see? Okay? So the, the, even the word mesoscopic is something that is in between microscopic and macroscopic. And this is the idea. The idea is to see how quantum effects are going to disappear in the macroscopic limit, or not. Okay, so this is the idea. Good. Uh, so, um, most of what I will uh, tell 
today and tomorrow, but not the day after, is uh, summarized in a book that I wrote with a colleague uh, at uh, Orsay in France, uh, Gilles Chambaud. And this is called Mesoscopic Physics of Electrons and Photons. So no surprise. So now let's start and uh, introduce uh, mesoscopic physics. So I think that the uh, first canonical example of mesoscopic system is what is called the Aronov-Bohm effect. Who heard about the Aronov-Bohm effect? Who never heard about the Aronov-Bohm effect? Okay, good. This is also good to, to give you a, a brief overview. So before uh, the Aronov-Bohm effect in disordered conductors, I will start with uh, the Aronov-Bohm effect uh, as, uh, as a basic effect in quantum mechanics. So but then after this, I will discuss phase coherence and effect of disorder. Uh, you know, all this you will see. Why to, to say all this now? Well, you know, yeah. You see quantum crossings, you are already afraid. So why to... Uh... So uh, the framework. The framework of what we are going to, to study is what's called a multiple scattering of waves. Multiple scattering of waves means a situation that is opposite to that situation. When you uh, learn about scattering theory, either in quantum mechanics or in uh, electromagnetism, what you what you learn is single scattering, which means there is one wave entering a wave vector, one outgoing wave vector, and calculate a cross section to be scattered from K to K prime. Okay, so this is what we learn. Uh, I'm not interested in this situation, I'm interested in the other situation, the incident plane wave, and you have at least a twice the number of Avogadro of scattering events before you exit the system. Less than this, I, I'm not interested. It's not two scatterings or three. It's really an Avogadro number of scattering. Okay, it's very important. So we are not interested in the first question. Therefore, this is called multiple scattering of waves. Okay? Uh, so here, there are, uh, what I said, uh, there are only two characteristic lengths in this. So again, I will mix the, uh, the uh, situations of electrons in metals and uh, electro electromagnetic waves in suspensions, whatever, it's the same language, but I will mix the uh, uh, denominations. So here I say that I have two characteristic lengths. One is the wavelength of the incident uh, wave. So for metals, it is mostly the Fermi waves, okay? So if you want to describe transport in metals, there is only electrons at the Fermi energy that contribute, okay? So for this wave, this is obvious. And there is another length that describes all the mass that uh, uh, takes place here, which is this multiple scattering. And this length is what is called the elastic mean free pass. Elastic mean free pass means that each time that there is a, a scattering of the wave, the energy is not lost, the energy is conserved, only the direction of the wave vector is changed and eventually lost, okay? But scattering is elastic. There is absolutely no loss of energy here. You always me? Yeah, uh, always me. Uh, then we will uh, discuss a limit which is called the weak disorder. And the limit of weak disorder is when the uh, wavelength of the wave is much smaller than the elastic mean free pass. And this means, in fact, broadly speaking, that the scattering events are independent. It's a kind of, uh, I heard in the previous uh, lesson, uh, people that were uh, stochastic. Get about the previous uh, scattering. This is in this limit of weak disorder. Okay, so uh, now this is the framework. Now a canonical mesoscopic effect, the Aronov-Bohm effect. So the Aronov-Bohm effect was uh, uh, discovered, but was put uh, to the front of, uh, of uh, physics by the, those two uh, gentlemen, 
uh, Aronov and Bohm. And I must be proud to say that uh, they were both at my institution at the time. I was a student, and uh, David Bohm was his uh, PhD advisor. In 1959, that even my even me. Okay, so uh, it has been discovered well, even 10 years before this famous paper by uh, two uh, uh, British people, uh, Aaron Bell today. Uh, people did not notice uh, the paper because it was written in a very, in a very, I mean, non-convincing way. But eventually, but the, the same is there. But today it is called the uh, Aronofsky effect uh, after those two uh, people. So the idea is very simple. Uh, <clears throat> you take a, a young slit experiment like uh, we we learn in quantum mechanics, okay, and then. You put here a, a, a flux, a magnetic flux, but the flux is such that the magnetic field is absolutely zero except on the point here where there is this uh, magnetic flux line. Okay? So this is a situation that is extremely difficult to realize. And uh, this means that where are the electrons? So here there are electrons that are emitted, okay, here and here. Where are the electrons? There is absolutely no Lorentz force, no effect field, okay? And in the previous uh, so question is this kind of uh, a magnetic flux can be gauged out? If the force, a big force, you know, a magnetic uh, Lorentz force can be gauged out, perhaps this one, you know, this uh, no force uh, magnetic flux could be gauged out also. It cannot. So again, the rule of the game is that the, the idea was to, to show that uh, what is important in that, uh, the vector potential would have an importance. Usually, it's not, we learn that it's not very important. Here, where are the electrons? There is absolutely no field, zero field, which means that if there is something, it's only the vector potential that describes this field. You are with me? It's very simple. Uh, okay, so in the distribution of the intensity, which means the square of the wave function on the, on the screen here, and the dependence uh, upon the flux that is here, okay? The dependence, this means that electrons are sensitive to the vector potential. If there is no dependence, they are not sensitive to the vector potential because the field is zero, okay? You calculate uh, uh, the quantum amplitude, so we know how to do this. There are two uh, quantum amplitudes, the amplitude to go through this slit, the amplitude to go through that, through that slit, and there are uh, the two amplitudes, and uh, there are phases here, delta one and two, for this uh, uh, trajectory and that one. Two uh, phase, phases are what? Are delta one zero, which is the phase just associated the geometric phase that is related to this length, okay? And there is another part of the phase which just uh, enters into uh, the calculation of the amplitude, which is the integral of the uh, vector potential along this trajectory. You don't hear me? You lost all what I said since the beginning. <laughs> Okay. 
So uh, there are uh, two No, I was still here. So th those are the two uh, phases, the phase that, has, that is associated to this amplitude and the phase that is associated to that amplitude, delta 1 and delta 2, okay? And then you want to calculate the intensity in the screen, so it is given by just principle of quantum mechanics. You have to sum the quantum amplitudes and then take the square of this, okay? So when we do this, what do we get? We get uh, the sum of two uh, intensities and an interference term. Okay, so this interfer so th this is the, the 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 sum of the two intensities and the interference term just oscillates with the phase difference between the two uh, uh, trajectories, right? So this phase difference is, as you see, it is modulated by uh, the magnetic flux. Why? Because this phase difference, uh, according to what we uh, wrote earlier, it is this, uh, this geometric phase difference, plus now uh, the uh, circulation of the uh, vector potential around a closed trajectory. And this closed trajectory is just this closed trajectory. All this is a closed trajectory, so there is a flux through it. Okay? And this is with what you see uh, here. And this term is just nothing but the unclosed magnetic flux. Okay, so it's 2 pi, phi, the flux, divided by phi zero, where phi zero is just uh, h divided by e. It's a uh, quantum of a uh, magnetic flux. Good. So there is a continuous change of the state of interference as a function of phi which derives from a vector potential only without any applied magnetic field on the electrons. And a quantum effect, the electrons are sensitive to the vector potential and not necessarily to the field. This is the essence of the Aronoff-Bohm effect. Now you can read their paper. Their paper is infinitely complicated than this, uh, but it's nonetheless uh, very interesting, but uh, th this is really uh, uh, <clears throat> the essence of this. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, this are one of the effects for the young sleepers. Now, what happens in a real uh, conductor? So in a real conductor, what you have to do is to replace this setup by uh, this setup where here I have a metal, here I have another metal, so electrons are coming here, are uh, going out here, and here you build something that should look like this, that replaces the slits, and this is just a ring, a metallic ring, and in this metallic ring, you apply a flux, which corresponds to one magnetic flux line, such that on the electrons that are confined to the metal, there is no uh, uh, Lorentz force, okay? So it's the same situation. And what you measure, so the, uh, here it's multiple scattering, because if you take uh, such a, a, a metallic ring of uh, copper, say, okay, then there are a lot of impurities. There is multiple scattering of electrons which sit at the Fermi energy with a given elastic mean free pass. Okay, and then you ask the, the question, what is the equivalent of the, uh, of the intensity? What is the equivalent of the intensity is the conductance through this uh, ring. Okay, so you have electrons entering, they feel this uh, Aronov-Bohm flux, they go out, and you measure their conductance. Question, is the conductance a function of the uh, flux? And this was the answer. It was provided in this very famous experiment in uh, 1985, which only part of us were born, uh, not all of us, <coughs> but it was the web uh, et al. And here is the result. The result, you see, so this is the uh, uh, experimental setup. This is the ring. And it was a gold ring, not copper one. And you see that uh, the conductance oscillates as a function of the, of the flux. And there is one peak at a, a phi zero, which means that you see precisely an oscillation of the conductance with phi, phi zero. So of bomb uh, effect uh, uh, in this conductance. So now this is a measurement of the conductance, which means the same thing that you take a, 
a, a, a wire of copper here on the table or in the lab, and you measure the conductance. And if I tell you, okay, look, you know, what you measure is something that is quantum because there is this aronoff bohm effect, you will tell me, this, is, this does not, uh, in my lab, this does not happen. And you will be right. So here is a mesoscopic effect, which means we have a system that exists. It has a, a few micron uh, uh, lengths, and it shows a quantum, it exhibits a quantum effect. So when are we going to lose this quantum effect? That's the, the question. If we, so we see this, it means that it's mesoscopic, it's quantum, but uh, what are the conditions to lose this effect? Okay, so the, the first thing is that uh, phase coherent effects subsist in disordered metals, which means that you have to rec we need to reconsider the actual Drude theory, which is a classical theory of transport. Okay? In, in the Drude uh, theory of transport, you cannot have something like this. That's why it is classical, although it depends on the Fermi energy, but it's classical. So here, obviously, it's not classical. So uh, the Webb experiment has been realized on a ring of size uh, a, a micron. And uh, what I just said is that if now I take a huge, big ring, a microscopic ring, then we know that we will not see this uh, uh, aronoff bohm effect. So it must exist a characteristic length, which is called the phase coherence length, coherence length beyond which all coherent effects disappear. So, Okay, this, now the question is, what is the uh, origin of this phase coherence length? And usually, people do not really know. Until today, 19, 1985, until today, we don't know really. So there are, uh, of course, uh, many possibilities which definitely destroy this uh, 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 quantum effect. One possibility is to, uh, to couple your electrons to thermal excit excitations, for instance, phonons. So you lose energy. I told you energy, then uh, you will lose this current effect. Uh, you could have a chaotic dynamical system. Uh, you know what is a Feynman chain? You read the electromagnetic uh, book, the, the book of uh, Feynman lectures in physics. Did you read this? Yes? No? So there, there is an example of what is called the Feynman chain. So it's a very nice example. But anyway, electron-electron interactions. So there are many possibilities to, uh, to give, uh, um, to, to get a phase coherence length. But usually, we don't really know. So uh, in order to observe coherent effects, you need that the size of your system to be much smaller than the phase what I don't know what it is, okay? but it, it must be smaller. It depends on temperature for what I wrote uh, before. And uh, uh, in order to be of the order of one micron, you need to work at about uh, uh, 10 millik. So th this, is, this explains why those experiments are very low temperature experiments and very small systems. So, but now, uh, <coughs> A question that you could ask, which is a very important question, is the following. You could say, okay, but uh, in this uh, a coherent effect, perhaps the disorder erase, erases the coherent effect. Okay? You don't believe this, or do you believe that the disorder could uh, erase such an effect? Well, the point is that in the experiments, I showed you that uh, there is multiple scattering of electrons, so there is disorder, but we saw the effect. So the disorder apparently does not wash out this effect, right? Okay, let's see if it is true. So uh, uh, this uh, phase coherence leads to interference effects for a given realization of disorder. What do I mean by this? I mean by this that the web experiment has been done for a system with a fixed configuration of disorder. Impurities are just fixed. I don't know what they are. There is this elastic scattering. And uh, this is what I obtain. But if now I average over the disorder, I should expect that this uh, uh, dependence on phi will vanish, will disappear. 
Is it true? So let's see. This is the experiment, uh, the, the formula that we wrote. I told you that there are not many formulas in, in my talk today, right? So uh, we saw that uh, there is this uh, oscillating term, cosine of uh, delta, delta zero plus this. This, in fact, is the geometric phase that is associated to those bizarre trajectories of the electrons in the rings. So this depends on the disorder. You are with me? So now, if this depends on disorder, if I average this conductance over the disorder, which means over this phase, the average of this cosine will just disappear. It will give zero, including this term. And therefore, we will get that uh, the average g of phi is equal to g0, which is the Drude formula without any oscillation. So you see, you didn't want to agree with me. Effect. Okay, no current effect anymore. So this is uh, bad. Okay. Only that it requires current effects. So uh, this is the second interest of mesoscopic physics, is to see why this is not true. Okay? So uh, <clears throat> now uh, that we discussed this uh, Aronobom effect, and before I answer why this is not true, I want to formulate the same point, but not from the uh, point of view of quantum mechanics of electrons in conductors, but from the point of view of uh, waves, electromagnetic waves in uh, disordered systems. So for me, disordered systems, elastic system will be a glass of milk, for instance. Milk is a suspension of, uh, of uh, proteins which uh, scatter the light elastically. So this is the idea, okay? be a cloud if you want, but uh, this is the idea. So this is what we have. This is the analogous uh, problem. Uh, we have here a disordered system. We have ingoing waves, outgoing waves, and we want to know uh, what is the uh, uh, behavior of the system. So if I do not average over disorder, so I have here a fixed distribution of scatterers, what I obtain uh, from the outgoing light is what is called a speckle pattern, okay? So this is, this is an experimental speckle pattern, okay? So it's just a, a distribution of uh, bright and black spots. Black spots is where the interference is destructive. A bright spot is where the interference is constructive, and you have all what you, you need in between, okay? So this is a, an interference picture. Right? Uh, <clears throat> so now if I average uh, this interference picture, so this is the same interference picture, but now taken for a suspension of uh, scatterers that move with time. So this is now the proteins in the milk, okay? So first you take a snapshot of a of speckle. You uh, average over time, which means you, you, you let time evolve and you see, what, you see what, what happens to your speckle pattern. And you see average over, which means that uh, the motion of the, of the scatterers just kill this interference effect. No surprise. Yes? No, no. No, no, but I will. Uh, In the previous picture, uh, why most of it is red instead of any colors in between? What, what, what? If, what is what? Why is most of the colors, colors red instead of any other color in between? No, it is, uh, well, uh, uh, it is not, there is a lot of black. Um, you see a lot of red, but this is because you are uh, tired like me. But uh, in fact, it's quite, no, no, really, it's, uh, it's quite uh, well, uh, uh, distributed, okay? Also, it looks that there is not a lot of green, but there is also green, quite a lot. Uh, so, again, if you average over the disorder, this uh, uh, speckle pattern disappears completely, the red like the black, everybody, and this is what remains. So, uh, what I claim now that there is an equivalent of the Aronov 
text in this setup. Okay, so let's see it. Uh, uh, I mean, in the setup of the, okay. Pause. This for, uh, I'm going back and forth between electromagnetic waves and, uh, and electrons, okay? So I considered the electron with this fixed uh, distribution of scatterers. I went to uh, waves, the speckle patterns, single distribution. And now I'm uh, going back to this uh, Aronov-Bohm uh, effect, but in a different setup. And this setup is the following. Now I want to perform this average over disorder. So in order to do this average over disorder, what uh, those two uh, guys, Charvin and Charvin, so this is Y squared here, it's the, the father and the son. It was in the Soviet Union, something that you, you know that it existed, something like this. It was in the Soviet Union, and it was exactly at the same time of the Webb experiment. So what they did was uh, to do an experiment that is analogous to that of Webb, but on a hollow cylinder, uh, very high, and pierced also by uh, aronov bomb flux. And what they did is to measure the conductance between uh, up, and this is just a wire that is a, a ride, a wired around this cylinder, and uh, the conductance is between those two points. So which means that this is just superposition of many web rings. So this corresponds to an average over disorder of uh, just not just one web ring, but many web rings. Okay, so therefore here we should expect to see the uh, dependence on the magnetic flux to disappear because we average over disorder. So indeed, uh, the, the signal of the conductance that was modulated at phi zero, this phi over phi zero disappears. Yes. I, in fact, uh, use it, no? Ah. Sorry. Um, why do you say that you are making like an average and not like just uh, having a bigger coil? It's not a bigger one because it has the same, uh, this, this size here, the radius of the ring ah, the is just the same L as the one of, of uh, web. Okay. It's just that here, you pile up many of those rings uh -huh. over uh, this uh, height LZ. Okay, well, I was saying like, considering that uh, the electrons will go like, will go this spiral. Yeah, yeah. But they are uh, going yes. through a ma yeah, but major length. Right? Yeah, you can, you can think of it that after each ring, in fact, uh, the electron pursues the, the road and sees another distribution of disorder. Okay. And another one, and if there are many rings, this corresponds to many distribution of uh, disorders, many configurations, mm -hmm. and this conductance should be just average. Okay. Mm -hmm. This was the idea. In fact, this was not the idea, but, uh, but uh, it happened to be the case. So indeed, the, what we web obtained on the setup, which is a, 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 an oscillation with phi zero, disappears. There is no... So it's But the surprise was that in, instead, you have an oscillation at phi zero over two. And this was really uh, something terrible. It was even political, because the experiment of Webb was done at IBM in the US. The experiment of Shervin and Shervin at the same time was done in the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, uh, IBM at that time was just uh, the finest the high tech, they said, okay, those Russians, they don't understand uh, how to measure things, so they simply made a mistake, okay? But the Russians said, you know, we understand the much better than those Americans, and uh, our result is the right result. It's phi zero over two, it's not phi zero. Okay, so then we're back and forth, and the point is that both of them, okay? Which means that when you average over the disorder, this is true that if you don't average, you get an oscillation with phi zero. If with phi zero over two, what we are going to do in this first lesson is, and also the next one, is to understand this difference between the two, okay? So, but the, the first take home message is that a disorder average uh, 
uh, phase coherent effect, quantum phase coherent effect. Good. The experiment uh, of this is the resistance as a function of, of H of the, of the flux, in fact. And you see that there is a beautiful oscillation, but this oscillation is at phi zero, is modulated at phi zero over two. So you cannot, it's not, there is no mistake. There is a modulation, okay? But it's just with phi zero over two. Okay, so uh, after all, this order does not seem to raise current effects, but just to verify. So now we go back to our uh, electromagnetic speckle pattern. Ask the same question. So we over the that <laughs> it's personal. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So uh, uh, this is a cut of this picture uh, along a given direction. So you see that there are oscillations of the, the intensity. And now the question is that if I average over this order, what I did before, is a... Uh, is something phase dependence uh, going to remain or not? And here is the answer. The answer is that uh, when you average over this order, you would expect something, an intensity that is flat with the angle, but it is not. You see, this is the, what you obtain. So this is, this is the average of D, same angular dependence. And this is in the picture. What you see, in fact, is that there is a remaining phase coherent effect which uh, takes place at a k plus k plus k prime equal to zero, which is called the backscattering. And this coherent effect is called the coherent backscattering. So when you average over this order, there is an effect that remains, and this is exactly at the same level of the phi zero over two of Charville. Okay, so now again, what we said is that uh, this order should erase everything. Why is there something like this? So it's the same answer for the Charvin uh, Charvin effect. You are with me? Yes? Who is just in another sphere? Okay. So uh, if this order is not related to decoherence, this order does not destroy phase coherence and does produce irreversibility. So how to understand uh, average coherent uh, effects? Uh, so to try to understand this, we will use a, a, a picture that is very close to what is called the <coughs> Feynman pass integrals. You know what, is, what are Feynman pass integrals? Yes? Who never heard about Feynman pass integrals? Oh, it's not like mesoscopic physics. Everybody here. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, you remember, we have multiple scattering. Multiple, this is inside the system. We enter with a given k wave vector, fixed. And there is an outgoing k prime vector. And in between, uh, your wave or your electron, here it's uh, the same picture, is going to a uh, uh, full uh, multiple scattering passes, and each of those passes is in fact a, a, a quantum trajectory. Okay, so those are the, those trajectories i, j, etc. So if I want to calculate the total amplitude, the quantum amplitude to go from k to k prime, I have to sum over all uh, initial point of the first scattering and over all final point of the last scattering event uh, of a given amplitude to go from R1 to R2, which is this guy, times a phase factor, which tells me that I'm scattered here at R1 with K, this is this, and here at R2 with K prime, which is this. 
And this depends on, this f depends on R1, R2. What is this f? This f is the sum of all the amplitudes like we, see, we saw in the two slit experiments. So this is uh, the sum over all the, the uh, multiple scattering amplitudes, i, j, etc., of uh, an amplitude and a phase. For the uh, Young experiment, we had only two. So here we have infinite number of such trajectories. Yes? Yep, you're with me? Oh, yeah. This f r1 r2, this is the same as the scattering amplitude in the scattering problem. Yeah, uh, yes, but in the scattering problem, you have r1 is equal to r2, and you have just one scattering. You enter with k, you, uh, you go out with k prime, and there is only one r that's scattered. But here, okay. this is the first scattering, but here there are infinite number of scatterings. I told you Avogadro number, and those are all those points. And all those points, they are inside this uh, uh, multiple scattering superposition of multiple scattering trajectories. So this is the difference between single scattering and multiple scattering. In single scattering, you have R1 equals to R2 and just one scattering. OK. It shouldn't be like Sorry? It shouldn't be like Yeah. Well, OK, this is, uh, if you want to, to make calculation, uh, eventually it will be an integral. But just it's. Uh, to, uh, to explain, but I indeed, you are right. <clears throat> and let me see, see, see if I understand well. So each path of this will be an f function, yes? No, is it? no, the f is the sum of all those passes. Ah, OK, is, it, is the sum of all the passes? Yeah, yeah. Ah. f is, you see, it's the sum of all j's, which are all those trajectories. They are infinite, infinitely many. OK, 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 so this becomes our integral. Yes, yes, Later. you okay. can write it uh, afterward as an integral, a pass integral, and all this, but here it's just to, to, to explain how it works, but okay. indeed. Thanks. Okay, so uh, this is the total uh, amplitude to go from k to k prime. Good. So now uh, I want to calculate the intensity. So the intensity is the, uh, I have to sum all the amplitude and to square it. So here it is. Uh, the square of this is the sum over, uh, so this is why I'm not using integrals, because it's uh, uh, less cumbersome. Okay, so it's a sum over R1, R2, R3, R4. Uh, those two uh, half F uh, uh, total amplitude, F of R1, R2, uh, F complex conjugate of R3, R4, and two uh, terms like this. So it's exactly this square, right? Okay, so now... <coughs> This product of, R of F and F star is the sum over all uh, trajectories J, all traje trajectories J prime of those uh, uh, amplitudes and phases. Notations are clear? Yes? You don't say this to please me. You really mean it. Yes? OK. So now, uh, this is not average over this order. So I have this. And now I want to average over this order. So what happens when I average over this order? Suppose that they are now, I take two uh, given trajectories, this one and that one, OK? So those two trajectories, they have uh, two different phases, delta j and delta j prime. What is the typical value of the phase associated to a given trajectory j? So it's dimensionless number. What would you say that it is? What is the typical? Uh, so uh, let's do it together. In fact, uh, uh, the phase here is nothing but. So this is the same of uh, Feynman integral. This is why I asked. But you, you know what is Feynman integral. So then you know the answer. The answer is that this is the length of this trajectory divided by the only length that we have. There is only one wavelength here, you remember? Lambda f or lambda, 1 over k. And in fact, this is the ratio of those two lengths. The length of the trajectory divided in units of the wavelengths. So this is the phase. But you see that now, if we compare two trajectories, in fact, the dephasing between them is just the difference between the two lengths of those two trajectories in units of lambda. 
But if those two trajectories are not identical, this means that they differ at least by one scattering event. You are with me? And this uh, scattering event, its length is the elastic mean free pass. But what we said, we said that we are in the limit of weak disorder, that the wavelength is much smaller than the elastic mean free, pa mean free pass, which means that the, the, uh, the phase shift between any two different trajectories is always much, much larger than one, which means that they give zero. Beautiful, you liked it? Okay. So uh, the idea is that those, all those trajectories, they will uh, interfere destructively when I average over them because of uh, this idea. And this, of course, does not uh, occur for single scattering. It's only uh, multiple, sc multiple scattering results. So the only remaining contributions to the intensity correspond to terms with zero dephasing, meaning identical trajectories. Okay, all the rest wash out because of the average, of the decay. So though this is what remains. Only identical trajectories, which means that when I consider now one trajectory and the, you remember there is one trajectory and the complex conjugate of it. Perfection. So uh, what kind of uh, profile this intensity can give us? What, identical trajectories? Well, excuse me? What kind of profile? Intensity. This amplitude can give us. This is the. This is the intensity. So yes. This is uh, what we will measure. Oh, the profile. Uh, it's uh, Lagarde Gauss, uh, Hermit Gauss. Uh. This, I don't know. This is a very difficult question. Uh, I, no, I know, the, but uh, this is a very difficult. I'm even. This. question that I can answer. So, uh, so the idea here is that uh, we will have only, uh, on average, what remain are identical trajectories, which means that uh, a trajectory and the are the same. So this is what happens, okay? They go through the same sequence of uh, scattering to the intensity, right? But here, the phase, the remaining phase, is zero. No phase. All the phase just this is, this is what we have. But there is a, a beautiful theorem that is uh, called the reciprocity theorem, which is uh, explained and demonstrated for single scattering in the Landau and Lifshitz of quantum mechanics which uh, can be uh, rephrased the following way. Uh, if I see you, then you see me. Which means, so this is positive theory, okay? So this means that if you have one given uh, trajectory, then the opposite trajectory, the reverse, the time reverse trajectory, has exactly the same probability. Okay, this means what? This means that if I consider now here I have two trajectories that are coupled, right? This, the, the, the continuous uh, line and the uh, dotted line. I can, uh, I can implement this reciprocity. I'm reversed. I can do this. You are with me? So if I do this, I will have exactly the same, but instead of going from k to k prime through all this, I will go from k prime to k through just the opposite trajectory. And this will give me intensity, because everything is time reversal invariant, right? But the reciprocity theorem does not tell me that you have to time reverse the intensity. It tells you that you can time reverse only one amplitude, and, the, and then you will get the same, the same intensity. So, which means that now I can just time reverse one of them, which is what I did in this second uh, picture. This is the same as before, but now I just took this one and I time reverse it. So it starts from R2, it goes through this, R1. Okay, so again, if you take this one, 
you reverse it, you get exactly this one. And Lando and Lifshitz, please notice, not, uh, not me, really great people, told you that this should give you the same, contribute equally to the intensity. Okay, so therefore I have to sum those two contributions, and the total average intensity will be now the sum of those two processes, which is, <coughs> uh, this is average over disorder, so you see that there are two terms. There is one which corresponds to this, so this is just F squared modulus of this. And there is this contribution, which is this times this. You see it? You just have to read what is written here. So here, this uh, factor is what? Is e to the power a k plus k prime times r1 minus r2, because I just evaluate the phase factor like we did at the beginning. No heavy mathematics, okay? So, uh, and I have to average this over this order. So this is not, a, a, because you see that, uh, so this is the incoherent classical term. And then you say, ah, look, this is good because we see an interference term when we average over this order. This is an interference term. Perhaps this is the one that we are looking for. But this is not because uh, so this is the interference term, but look what happens to this interference term. If I average, which means that I sum over all points R1 and R2, which are here, this term, what happens to it? To it? If you average over R1 and R2, this phase factor, zero. Okay? So this is what is written here. Generally, the interference term vanishes due to the sum over R1 and R2, except for two notable cases. The first case is when k plus k prime is equal to zero, because look at the expression. If, let's do it again. If k plus k prime is equal to zero, this is something that you control from outside, this factor is one. Remember backscattering? And the second situation, so, is the coherent backscattering. You see that when k plus k prime is equal to zero, which is the situation of backscattering, this is where we have this uh, uh, constructive interference. And the second situation is, uh, okay, so this is the backscattering. And the second situation is when R1 uh, minus R2 is equal to zero, which means that you consider This is precisely, this is precisely what happens in the, uh, in the Charvin and Charvin effect. What we are measuring, in fact, are closed loops. So this I will explain later on. But you see already that uh, if you have k plus k prime is equal to zero, this current term does not vanish, and you get uh, something that depends on the, on the phase, a constructive interference. So... Uh, Questions? I want to show you something because, uh, because I think it's nice. This is the, uh, uh, what is expected for incoherent light. So this is uh, light. You take just a, a bottle with milk. You shine laser light. And you look at uh, the reflected uh, intensity as a function of the angle. Okay, so uh, zero angle means k is equal to minus k prime. So this is back scattering, and all the other angles are other angles. <coughs> so here, this line is uh, just the uh, zero, the disorder limit uh, where you average everything over uh, over disorder. Nothing subsists. So this is this line, and you see that this is what is measured. Now this is the. Uh, um, <coughs> Uh, th those points, this is the experiment that was done. And the line is the theory. 
So uh, it agrees up to 10 to the minus 6, which means that there are not many theories in uh, condensed matter physics that agree with such uh, high precision. So it's not just a mere effect to, uh, to entertain you. It's real beautiful physics. Okay? The same with the uh, Charvin and Charvin effect. What you see here are two lines. One is the theory, and one is the experiment. And uh, uh, transport in uh, those uh, small systems is something which is very dirty and all this, but you see that it corresponds just very beautifully. So this is really beautiful physics. I mean, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is only one theory that gives better precision uh, with the experiments is QED. Okay? So just uh, to, to set the score. This is well understood physics. OK, so uh, quantum complexity. You have question about what I, I showed you? No? Yes. Can you go back to the coherent backscattering uh, slide? Yeah. Yeah, here. So if k1 plus k plus k prime is 0, then that uh, that 1 plus that thing becomes uh, 1, right, in the equation. Yes, so which means that you get instead of 1, which is this baseline here, you get 2. But why is this, I mean, uh, smooth variations of intensity? I mean, it should be a just offset. OK, so your question is the following. I, I have this expression, which of course is a, just to, to, ex to explain the, the mm -hmm. idea. It is a 1 plus 1 when k plus k prime is equal to 0. Yes. So which means that here, what you say, you say you should get 2 only for that direction, and all the rest it should give 0. Mm, yes. Yes. But it's a little bit more complicated to do the calculation, and this is what we will do tomorrow. But instead, what you, you get is that you go from 2 to 1, in a, in a given way. And the way how you do this, those are calculations. And, uh, you know, I showed you that I wrote a book on this. So there are okay. 400 <laughs> pages. So I had to do, to put something, we had to put something. So th those are the calculations. Okay. okay. But uh, this is, yeah, but this is an absolutely uh, uh, relevant question. Uh, why, how do we get this profile? Okay. But at least, you see that there is two instead of one. Hmm. Uh, OK, so uh, quantum complexity. <clears throat> uh, what we saw is that this order does not break phase coherence, and it does not introduce irreversibility. So what this order does is to introduce a randomness and complexity, which means that what we mean by randomness, randomness and the complexity is that all the symmetries are lost, uh, which means there are no good quantum numbers when you, we have disorder. Let's uh, look at an example. If I give you a, a given a circular aperture in optics, and I ask you to uh, tell me what are the solutions of the, of the wave equation, you know how to label each of them using an integer. It's like solving also the Schrodinger equation in a, in a well. Okay? You know how to label the energy levels with good quantum numbers. Yes? So, but now, when uh, you have multiple scattering, you lose this, uh, this symmetry. So here it was the uh, circular aperture. So this symmetry that you had, which was the rotation, rotational symmetry, if you have a many body, a many body a multiple scattering situation, you lose all those quantum numbers. But this does not mean that this system is less coherent than that one. It's just that here, you don't know to label a black, red uh, a, a spots with numbers. There is no way to do this. There is no symmetry. But the, the interference is not less here than it was there. OK? So this is the idea that a random system is complex. There are no good quantum numbers. But it does not mean that it's not coherent. Uh, 
So most quantum systems are complex, except those that we learn in uh, undergraduate studies. Uh, and complexity, openness, and decoherence are separate and independent notions. So again, you know, uh, decoherence means that you lose the interference picture, but complexity just means that it is uh, expressed in another way with good quantum numbers. Okay? So uh, this is what I, I wrote, and decoherence is something that is irreversible and that occurs for systems that are larger is a phase coherence links L5. So uh, a mesoscopic quantum system is a coherent complex quantum system, but with L smaller than L5, which means that there is no irreversible loss of coherence. You just have uh, uh, lost all the good quantum numbers. Okay? So this is the, the definition of a mesoscopic quantum system. And you see that there are effects that are measurable. Okay. So an example. What was the example? I don't remember. Ah, ah yeah, good. Uh, so an example is the, uh, you will see. There are two examples. So I consider a, a design system, and I consider it in the uh, uh, incoherent limit, which is L larger than L5. If I do this, this is the classical limit. No interference, nothing. Okay, so then I have a, a complex a random system, which is completely incoherent. Therefore, what I can do is to split it, to split it into a n a independent parts. n is just the ratio of l divided by l phi to the power d if it is a d-dimensional system. So I have a, a big system. It is completely incoherent, which means that the size of the system is much larger than L5. So I divide it into independent systems because I know that they are completely incoherent between themselves. And how many pieces like this? Just the ratio of those two lengths to the power D. Right? If it is one-dimensional, I cut it in uh, N pieces, L over L5. If it is two-dimensional, it is D squared, etc. You are with me? So uh, those uh, systems are statistically independent. And therefore, if there is a microscopic observable, the conductance, the intensity, whatever you want, uh, defined in each subsystem, it takes independent random values in each of the n pieces. Yes? Now I, yeah, you, you follow me. I see a bit of uh, some of you are losing me. Don't hide it. I, I see it. I'm a teacher, you know. I see it. So then we know that there is something that is called the law of large numbers. And any macroscopic observable is equal with probability 1 to its average value. Okay? If I'm in this limit. Good. And this means that the system performs an average over realizations of the disorder. This is just a rephrased things that you know very well. Yes? So what happens when L is smaller than L5 now? We expect, because of those effects, we expect deviations from the result that I just, this law of large numbers. We expect deviations. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, what do we need? First of all, we need a good understanding of the phase coherence length. This we don't have. And what we need now is a description of the fluctuations and coherence in complex quantum systems. So, so far I was discussing the average due to, uh, to uh, interference. Okay? And I'm interested in this. So, uh, in order to calculate uh, those uh, fluctuations, I will again go back to the electrical conductance, this uh, conductance of, uh, of a wire of copper. Okay? And uh, so what we know, I remind you, that the metal is modeled as a quantum gas of electrons scattered by an elastic disorder, what I said at the beginning. And at t equal to zero, and in the absence of decoherence, it is a complex quantum system, which means at zero temperature, there is absolutely no decoherence effect. All this is uh, just a perfect quantum mechanical conductor. 
And due to the disorder, there is a finite conductance, which is a quantum observable, okay? the conductance, electrical conductance that I measure. And classically, what I know is that the conductance of a cubic sample of volume LD is given by the Ohm's law, which tells us that the conductance is equal to the conductivity times L to the D minus 2. Do you know this formula? Who never saw this formula? But this is not true. Not true. You never saw uh, this. The resistance, the electrical resistance of a wire of length L and section S is the resistivity times L divided by S. Now, the conductance is the inverse of the resistance. The conductivity is the inverse of the resistivity. And this factor is just uh, L to the D minus 2. You never saw this? Never? I don't believe you. OK, so uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Ohm's law. And this is the Ohm's law. Huh? OK. <laughs> and now what, I'm, uh, what I want to know is a, a, what are the fluctuations of this conductance? Yes? Uh, you mentioned the, the temperature. Temperature equal to zero, yes. Uh, what's the temperature on the So uh, temperature, uh, it has several effects. One of the effects, so one is the broadening of the Fermi-Dirac uh, statistics, which is not a decoherence effect. But one is just the creation of uh, excitations in the system, which are called phonons. And now phonons, uh, they scatter the electrons. And this scattering is inelastic, which means that the electrons, they lose their phase and their energy. And this is a decoherence effect. OK? So I repeat the question, and you'll tell me if I answer it clearly. You, uh, no, no, I repeat the question. So the question is, uh, is any electronic system a zero temperature going to be a quantum coherent? And so the answer is, uh, I don't know. So I'm sorry you ask uh, difficult questions. Because I told you that uh, nobody really knows uh, the origin of decoherence. So obviously, phonons, as uh, I just said, is a, source, is a source of decoherence. But even at zero temperature, there could be other sources of decoherence. And therefore, I cannot rule out that there is decoherence even at zero temperature. So I can give you an example. There are electrons in, the, in this uh, conductor. We are at zero temperature. So. Uh, Situations. You know from a, a atom, atom. In fact, there is a spontaneous emission because of the fact that the electron also interacts with the uh, fluctuations of the quantum vacuum. And this means that the system is not isolated. Here, something like this could happen. Okay. Then, then my answer, I don't know. <laughs> but, 
Uh, okay, so uh, uh, classically, so now if we are, I'm coming back to my uh, fluctuations. Uh, if we are uh, at a length that is much larger than the case correctness, then uh, the relative fluctuations of the conductance are given by the law of large numbers, which says that the relative fluctuations of the conductance decrease like one of the number of independence. Okay? And then go to infinity, that relative fluctuations go to zero, which means that when you measure a conductor, they're the same conductance. something is something extremely simple is that uh, if I take a, a wire, a copper wire uh, in a lab in San Paolo and I measure the uh, resistance or the conductance and I take the same uh, wire with the same geometric uh, characteristics in, uh, in Haifa in my institution, we measure exactly the same thing. Okay? So this is self-averaging. This is the meaning of self-averaging, which means fluctuations go to zero, right? What I want to say now is that if we are not in the classical regime, that we are in OK. So uh, <clears throat> uh, this expression, uh, this delta G is uh, defined by this. This is the variance of the distribution. And G average is the Ohm's law. And this is the average over this order. So from this expression and that expression, we get that the fluctuations of the conductance go like L to the power D minus 4. Right? So this, we have this. So this square goes like 1 over L to the D. And this square goes like L to the 2D minus 4, which means that this goes like L to the D minus 4. OK? So the uh, variance of the conductance depends strongly on the size of the system. And uh, it diverges for dimensions that are uh, smaller than 4, which is usually what happens. OK? So, uh, so this is the uh, classical result. For the quantum mesoscopic system, what we will see, and this is exactly the same effect like the one we saw for the coherent backscattering or for the Charvin, exper or the Charvin oscilla oscillations, is that, in fact, the uh, fluctuations of the conductance, of the quantum conductance, they do not diverge like the sun. They are proportional to E squared over H times a number, pi, 2 over 15. In fact, it's 2 over 15. It depends on the, on the geometry. But and uh, y is squared over h because uh, <coughs> y is squared over h, by the way. I said that uh, the, 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 the width of the distribution of the conductance is a number which has no dimension times e squared over h. And therefore, it means that the uh, combination of conductance, is it true? True? Uh, I believe that uh, you know another, so this means that uh, it's possible the units of conductance of transport, electrical transport, in terms of fundamental constant, E squared, E and H. But I claim that you know another way to express a conductance or imped impedance in terms of fundamental constants. What is this other way? What is 377 ohm? Huh? No. 377 ohms. It is the impedance of the antenna of uh, 
electromagnetic field in the vacuum. It's the square root of epsilon zero divided by mu zero. This has also units of a conductor. <clears throat> and it's equal to 377 ohm. But E squared over H is equal to a, the inverse of, uh, inverse of this is 20 kilo ohms. It is much larger than this one. What is the ratio of those two uh, conductances? 20 kilo ohms, this one, and 377 ohms. It's a small number, 377 divided by 20. It's a small number, 20 kilo ohms. 377 divided by 20, 10 to the power of three. But it's a dimensionless number. And what is this dimensionless number? Yeah, yeah, it's the fine structure constant. So the fine structure constant that you hear about in uh, atomic physics, which are corrections uh, uh, to the usual spectrum of uh, quantum mechanics, this fine structure constant alpha, which was about 10 to the minus 2, is the ratio of the classical impedance of the vacuum to the quantum of the vacuum, which are those two quantities, okay? So which means that uh, this fluctuation of the electrical conductance in the quantum conductor is a way to measure directly the, uh, uh, the fluctuations of the, of, for the conductance of the quantum vacuum. Nice, you like it? The first time I, I heard it, I liked it very much also. No, really, it's really beautiful. So, but just the idea that uh, a conductance has units of H. But this you also know, which is called the quantum Hall effect. Quantum Hall effect is a measure of the whole conductance, which is not the dissipative conductance. It's another conductance, but it's also a conductance. And you have plateaus, which are at integer numbers times E squared over H. Why? Because it's a conductance. Okay? And this is why today, uh, uh, in fact, the uh, quantum Hall effect, well, this is already not true, but uh, for several years, the quantum Hall effect was used as a metrological uh, definition of the conductance. Okay? And because it is extremely accurate also. <clears throat> so back to our uh, mesoscopic quantum system. So, the result is that in a mesoscopic quantum system, uh, the fluctuations of the conductance, unlike the classical system, where they depend on, the, on the, the, the size of the system, they are constant, they are universal, and they are squared over h times a number that can be calculated and measured. Uh, so this is what is written here. Fluctuations are quantum, large, and independent of the source of disorder. This was for was asked at some point if it is a, a Gaussian disorder or whatever disorder, this is absolutely independent of it. For any disorder, you will get this, and those fluctuations of the conductance are called universal because of this. They do not depend on anything. Nice? So, uh, moreover, in the mesoscopic limit, the electrical conductance is not self-averaging, which means that uh, the, the, the relative fluctuations of delta G are extremely large, which means that if you take a quantum mesoscopic copper wire in San Paolo or at the Technion in Israel, you will measure for each of those because it is not self-averaging because of those quantum coherent effects. I made your day. Yes? Nice? So here is an example of this. It was the first measurement, but uh, so there is something uh, much nicer, but this is what I have. Uh, this is a conductance that is measured for three very, very different samples. One, uh, this is a gold ring. So you see the conductance as a function of the applied magnetic field. It fluctuates as a function of the applied mag magnetic field. 
And you see that in the uh, gold, so all this is in units of E squared over H. For a gold ring, this is the trace of the fluctuations. This is for a semiconductor, a silicon MOSFET uh, tap, which is di very different. Source of disorder is completely different. This is the uh, typical trace of the conductance. And this is a, a numerics on the Anderson model, which is a theoretical model, the binding model for uh, electronic systems in conductor. This is, you saw the tight binding model in the previous uh, uh, lesson, okay? So this is a tight binding model for electrons where, in fact, the, <coughs> the hopping term between different sites is random, okay? With uh, just a flat distribution. And what you see, before I answer the question, what you see here is that the value of the average conductance is extremely different. It differs each time by one order of magnitude. So typically, the average here is about 10 to the power of 3. Here it's 10. Here it's 1. But you see that in each of those cases, the fluctuations, which means the width of this, distri this, of this distribution, is of order 1. So of order 1 means in units of E squared over H of order, of order 1. So you see that here it is of order 1, also here and also here. So which means that the uh, width of the distribution does not depend on the size of the system, okay? So which means that you have fluctuations that remain at all scales. Those systems, they do not average to zero. So this is, again, due to uh, interference effects. This is my last slide. I just finished on time. So now you can ask questions. <clears throat> I think it is my last slide. Yes, it is. I was Nothing. going to ask if, if, if this was averaged or if, if it was uh, conduct if this conductance was averaged was an average and you say yeah but no no, no it is not no no no, no. this, this is, is a trace single, this is a single realization this is single no no for each value okay here is written b of t b of t is magnetic field it's yep. not Aronoff bomb flux mm -hmm. don't ask ask me to, tomorrow wh why what is b of t Today, this is not a Aronoff bomb flux. It's a real magnetic field. Mm. Why a real magnetic field can change the configuration, I will explain to you, but not now. Just take it as a parameter that for each B, you have a different configuration here. Okay. Okay. Each B is a different configuration, and you see that, indeed, it fluctuates from configuration to configuration. Mm. So the, the average here is something that is here. So it's about uh, 880. Okay, oh, this is so average. you take average of this fluctuation, is this? Yes, yes. Oh. But the width, which is the width of the distribution, is the distance, is this distance. Mm -hmm. Okay? And here it is this distance, and here it is this distance, and it's the same. Okay. Although the systems are extremely different, the average is, depends on the size. You see that the width of the distribution of the conductance is the same. Okay. Okay? Uh, before answering her question, you mentioned that uh, the fluctuations survive at all link scales. The fluctuations? Yeah. Yes. There is some sort of fractal behavior of the fluctuations? A, a, a sort of what? Fractal behavior. Fractal. Ah. Ah. Okay. I understand why you have this. Uh, in <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I like fractal very much, but uh, here there are no fractals. No, no. Because... It does not depend on the size in a very weird way, like in fractals. It simply does not depend on the size. It's just constant, flat. It's the E squared over H times the number. That's it. Uh, just a question of curiosity. Here. Who is curious? <laughs> uh, it's about your interpretation about, uh, with the Feynman path integral, because usually we consider one particle and we say, okay, between two points, we have all the paths possible, and we, but we have a preferred path, which is the classical one. Now you're presenting a system uh -huh. with two preferred paths, but I was thinking that maybe, do you have any classical interpretation of those preferred paths? Of, no, there of the are light? No, uh, Be yeah. Because, because the, the disorder? No, there are no two preferred paths. There is only one, which is the average. On average, 
if you, go, if you want to go from R1 to R2. In fact, the contributions of all the other uh, Feynman passes will just cancel. What remains is just one pass and its complex conjugate. This is the equivalent of when you do a, 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 a Feynman pass integral, what you have to do in fact is to find the pass of minimal action, right? The pass of minimal action here is the pass what, that corresponds to the average over this order. There is one, there is one. This is the same. So which means that if you want, uh, you can do this, by the way, it's very entertaining, and really reformulate all this in terms of a, a field theory. It has a name. It is called the nonlinear sigma model. And you look for the uh, minimal action uh, path, and you will find that this is the average theory. So here it was just uh, without using all those fancy words, doing this for you. But uh, if you want to do real calculations, and for instance, get uh, the dependence on the angle of what I showed, you have to, you have to, to go to resolvent, field theory, and, and diagrams, and we will see diagrams tomorrow. Okay. Real diagrams, I mean. Thank Today you. was without calculation. I promise without calculation. Or we'll, we'll get calculation. But the idea is here. Thank you. You should take this opportunity because the microphone works. So in a, in a second, it could just uh, you don't realize stop. that the electricity works. If you don't I realize that. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> ah. Professor, uh, just one question. Who is asking questions? <laughs> Ah, yes. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> no, because he has a Oh, no, no problem. Uh, my, my question is, when you propose this model, and if you, have, if you had uh, like inspiration in the handle, hand on walk. In the hand on walk. Yeah. And uh, when you thought about how to approach this problem, and uh, how this approach about the, the average path, and how this, this calculation, if you have this had this in mind. Uh, okay, so first, first of all, first of all, good. First of all, I did not propose any model. That's the whole idea. That I, 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 I showed a result, effect, but there is no model here. Now your question is, uh, is it possible to, uh, to use a random walk diffusion in order to understand what we did here? Is it? Uh, no. no, OK. When you, when you describe your, your uh, Sorry, I had a uh, power off. And when I square? No, yeah. When you, when you thought about this, uh, this, uh, these results that you got, because you want to uh, But which result? Which one? Well, uh, we, in the, the article that the, the total intensity to go... Uh, yeah, it, there is like uh, in the one article from the peak disorder analysis, I believe on uh, physical review letters, 1986. From, from whom? Yeah, for, uh, for you, from you, I believe. Ah, from me? Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, I believe that's your, uh, I don't know your PAT. Okay, okay. And uh, in, in the, basically in one of the, the last paragraphs, you you just talk about the random walk, and uh, so it's basically if this the, this result that you got, you you basically have this random walk thoughts after you got this, or if you have this in mind when you when you approach this problem. This tomorrow. Tomorrow you will you will just add no. I will discuss random walks and corrections to corrections to random walks. All this is the program of uh, tomorrow. We are uh, to build a, a model. Now, there is no model here. How to uh, describe classical effects. Classical effects are basically random walks of, of the electrons or of the light. 
and quantum corrections are modification of random walk in a quantum way that takes into account those residual uh, phase effects. But this goes beyond random walk. And this is what makes this problem an interesting field theory. Okay? But all this is the program of tomorrow. And the program of the third day will be how to reformulate this quantum random walk in a fancy way. Uh, professor, in the next lecture, will you talk about more uh, about co the coherence effects? No. Can you tell us uh, quickly about the open problems uh, regarding the coherence uh, today? Everything is uh, open. I mean, we have really no clue about what. Uh, I mean, we have clues. I mean, I told you that phonons, of electrons by phonons, they uh, decoherence effect. So if they are phonons, you are you are bad. I mean, sorry. Uh, but they can be other decoherence effects. So you can ask, for instance, if electron-electron interactions gives rise to a decoherence. Because in a real metal, they are, the electrons, they interact. For, uh, for the waves, photons, they do not interact. We are safe. But electrons, they do interact. So already, first question. Is it possible to get decoherence from electron-electron interaction? So what is your answer? Let's vote. Who is in favor that electron-electron interaction can lead to decoherence? Who is against? Who is neutral? <laughs> so uh, one of the uh, main characteristics of electron-electron interaction is that they preserve momentum. So therefore, they cannot leave, leave, give rise right to decoherence. They cannot. Except if you have a finite size system, because then you don't uh, conserve momentum, and therefore you could have, as a finite effect, uh, decoherence induced uh, by <coughs> electron-electron interaction. But for an infinite system, you cannot. <coughs> so this already takes out a big source of problem that uh, it can be the Hubbard model, or it can be liquid, or it can be whatever. This does not give rise to uh, decoherence. For instance, as I told you, there could be interactions with the quantum vacuum, and everything, interaction with the quantum vacuum is driven by the fine structure constant, and I showed you that the fine structure constant plays a role, right? I showed you that this conduct, the quantum conductance and the classical conductance, they are related by the fine structure constant. So this, is, this can be a source of decoherence. Nobody knows uh, if it is, uh, what, if it works. But so, I don't know, I don't have answer to this. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, just um, about the, the irreversibility of, uh, of the decoherence. Like, uh, the, the loss of coherence, is, it's always irreversible? Or there is some quantum systems that... Wow. So you ask uh, two difficult questions, it's, uh, it's a problem. Uh, <clears throat> the answer is that it depends. Uh, for instance, uh, this is why I, I asked if you know the, this Feynman, this fine, Feynman uh, LC chain. Uh, in fact, decoherence, so you know this, uh, this is the Feynman chain. Okay, so this is a, a chain of quadrupoles, which are LC quadrupoles. If now I want to know what is the uh, impedance of this chain, if I have only one quadrupole, the impedance is purely imaginary. You agree with me? If I take two quadrupoles, the impedance is purely imaginary. You agree with me? This is the same if I take 15. But if I take an infinite number of quadrupoles, then the impedance uh, acquires a real part. 
which is the dissipative part, because it's real. You agree with me? I mean, this, this is known, but, uh, right? So then you say there is a finite resistance, therefore you lost energy. You, there is uh, irreversibility that enters, is, enters into the gate. So, but there is no, you know, each, each quadrupole here is purely dispersive. It's not resistive. So where is the loss of energy? How come that you get a, f a real part? So the, the idea is the following, is that when you measure a, conduct, a conductance or an impedance here, it's always the, me the impedance measures, in fact, the ratio of two things, of the energy that you put into this circuit, divided, in fact, the, the inverse, it, me it measures the ratio of the energy that you get back from the circuit divided by the energy that you put into the circuit, okay? And the point is that if you have an infinite chain, you put, in fact, you have to feed all those quadrupoles, and therefore, from the point of view of the measurement here, you will always lose energy, okay? So which means that this energy that you put inside the circuit, it takes an infinite time to go back. And this, you call it dissipation. But there is no dissipation. So in fact, the frequency, or better said, the time that uh, you need to get back all the energy that you put into your circuit is called the Poincaré recurrence time. Okay? The Poincaré recurrence time in this chain is infinite, which means that from the point of view of the measurement here, energy is lost, and this is irreversible. But there is nothing lost. It's just simply that you don't wait for long enough. Okay? So now, uh, extrapolate this situation, and each time that you have a situation that you call it irreversible, you have to think in terms of uh, Poincaré recurrence time. Is it that uh, energy was dissipated, or is it that uh, the time scales that you have that you if this energy is too long to wait. In this problem that I discussed, there is only elastic scattering, which means that each scattering event is like a quadrupole here. It is completely non-dissipative. There is no inelastic scattering. So which means that if you see at the end of the day a real, a real valued conductance or resistance, there is, no, there is nothing lost. It just you have an infinite number of scatterers, and therefore the time that you need to retrieve all the energy is infinite. It's exactly the same as here. So now, uh, your question was, who was, who was the question? Uh, you asked the question. <coughs> uh, is there, are there other sources of, uh, of such decoherence? And so, not any system is infinite. But for instance, I can take a chaotic system, which was one that I gave just uh, uh, very briefly. If you have a, a, a quantum chaotic system with a few degrees of freedom, and you couple your electrons to this a chaotic, quantum chaotic degrees of freedom, it will act also as if it is irreversible. But it is not. It's just because it's quantum chaotic that the uh, recurrence, uh, the Poincaré recurrence time is infinite. And you call it dissipation, irreversible dissipation. But uh, the, the, the notion of ir irreversibility <coughs> depends very much on, on the problem. So a problem that, you know, that uh, can be uh, uh, irreversible if you, wait, if you don't wait long enough is reversible if you wait long enough. But I, I can change the question. So uh, there is a system where the, you can see uh, a history of the coherence. Is there a system that... It, there exists something like that. That, uh, that you can monitor this irreversibility? Yeah, yeah. Like you can have coherence in... Yes, yes. Uh, a, a quantum chaotic cavity, for instance, is something like that. All right. You have really to think about this, but you can engineer whatever you want. But there are uh, effects, for instance, this uh, uh, coupling to the fluctuations of the vacuum that you don't know how to... Uh, uh, control it because 
you know, there, are, there is an infinite number of modes, so it's the same idea. If you have an electron that interacts with the fluctuations of the vacuum, each, the vacuum is made as, as a superposition of uh, harmonic oscillators, photons. And if there is an infinite number of those photons, it's like an infinite number of quadrupoles here, you will call it dissipation, but there is no dissipation. I mean, this depends on the, you know, on your definition. Thanks. More questions? Hello. Yeah, I have a linked question with this, uh, what he asked. So uh, regarding this restoration of coherence, uh, that superfluid to mod insulator that we uh, deal in the case of ultra cold gases, there we can also restore the coherence even after, uh, after we pass through the mod insulating stage. So is this the same one we can think of about? Like we are going from superfluid to mod insulator and then coming back. Then the coherence, we will restore the coherence again in the system. I, I, I told you, you asked me two difficult questions. I have no answers. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, really, I, I don't uh, I, I sure that I understand properly the, the question. So you say that if I have a, a mod Hubbard a system, electronic system? It's a fermionic? ultra cold system. Huh? Ultra cold atom system. So you have a condensate in optical lattice. Optical lattice. So from superfluid state to we are going to the deep mod insulating state. And then we again uh, just lower the depth so that we are again in the mod superfluid state. So again, we get the coherence back. So for me, those systems are not really coherent. I mean, uh, it's a dif different uh, um, <coughs> definition of coherence. They are not really coherent. Sorry. <laughs> no, really. I, uh, now I understand your question. I think that they are not really coherent. I think they are classical in that sense. They are not quantum. It's disappointing, I know, but uh, this is... Uh, You know, classical is also fine. It's beautiful. <laughs> Don't have to be ashamed. <laughs> so what would be your definition of coherency in this case? Well, uh, no, I, I don't have a definition of uh, coherence. And uh, now, uh, you know, uh, for uh, the job. Uh, <clears throat> here I have a very operational way to, to define a coherent system. So what I said, if I see a, a dependence on the Aronoff bohm flux, my system is quantum mechanically coherent, at least partly, okay? Quantum interference. So this is a, this is a very operational definition. See, not very, you know, general and all this, but this is, uh, but it works. <coughs> But it's not only the More questions? No, they are tired. Yeah. OK. Anyway, tomorrow at the next lecture, everything will become clear. <laughs> but it was already clear. <laughs> no, tomorrow it will be, I will deconstruct. Yeah. <laughs> this was clear, and tomorrow it will not be clear. OK. Um, Okay, so tomorrow morning we restart the lectures at nine uh, with the lecture of uh, Marcelo Martinelli, uh, quantum optics, uh, and uh, that's it. So thank you very much, uh, Eric and everyone. <laughs>